Okay, so now we're, we, we, we talk about the uh, uh, playground. The, the projects were built on terraces. Each terrace would have uh, buildings that were set up in, in uh, three buildings, three buildings, and then an, a walkway, and then three buildings, and so on, mm -hmm. around these terraces. And um, I would say probably any of the kids that were my age, we were all friends. Some of the kids went to, if you lived on one side of Foster Avenue, you went to, uh, uh, Walt, I think it was, uh, uh, I can't remember, Huddy, Huddy Junior High School. If you lived on the other side where I lived, you went to PS 89, which was till eighth grade. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and of course, my brother had a lot of friends in that, in, from the projects as well. He grew up and they played football and they would chase us off the court when they came, they were the older guys. <laughs> but it was really, there was some anti-Semitism within the buildings themselves, but not from people who lived in the buildings. Mm -hmm. It would be from people that came into the park from outside. Um, but there was not just anti-Semitism, there would be anti-Italian or anti-Irish, or especially, and, and there were some people that, was, that were now Spanish speaking. Uh, just slightly, and they got a tremendous amount of heat from everybody. Mm. As a matter of fact, my closest friend in the projects well, it, it was and is a guy named Louis. His actually his actually Spanish name was Luis, L U I S Hernandez Villa, V I L L A R, Louis. Louis was born in Cuba. His mother was a hooker. His father was a French sailor, and he grew up in an orphanage uh, when he in the church. When he was, I believe, 12, his aunt, Maria, who was living in America, and she was a nurse, as she was living in the projects, she went to Cuba and got him out. That was his mother's sister, and she brought him to America. And because my father could speak a little Italian and some Spanish because of the people that worked in the shop, in the, in the factory, Louis felt comfortable in my house because he could say certain things in Spanish that my father understood because also my father lived in Argentina for the three years before my mother got him out of there. So there was a certain combination there that we, we, we became close. Mm -hmm. uh, so Louis remained my best friend. Well, you know, he, I'll tell you Louis' story later on. Louis, by the way, no one knows where he is now. He was, uh, he became the biggest, most influential importer of illegal marijuana in American history. Hmm. He was bringing in tanker ships, tanker ships full of marijuana. Did it for many, many years until finally he got, because of a stupid, bill that he refused to pay a gardener, $6,000, the guy turned him in. Mm. And Louis went to jail for a short while and then became a state's witness against generals, judges. So they put him in witness protection. Mm. And that goes back to the late 70s, early 80s. Nobody has seen or heard from him since. Wow. We're still looking for Louis. <laughs> well, by the way, Louis went to Oswego. He graduated from high school. Erasmus, who was a basketball player, but I'll get into that the next, well, later on. Mm -hmm. um, okay, the other two guys that we grew up with, almost like the four musketeers, was me and Louie, and then a guy named Mike Miller. Mike was a year or two older than us, but not able to keep up with the guys that were my brother's age, athletically. Mentally he could, but not athletically, so he tended to come more to the, he was like 16 going on 17, and we were 14 going on 15, but he hung out with us. Mm -hmm. uh, very nice guy. And then my friend to this day, who lives here in Vegas, the other guy, part of that group was a guy named Marvin, or Marv. His nickname was The Crust, because Marv would only eat the crust of the pizza. <laughs> He's still known as The Crust. Marvin Glovinsky, G-L-O-V-I-N, S-K-Y. Marv is a doctor of psychology. Lives in Vegas, been here 40 some odd years. Spoke to him this morning. 
actually asked him how much of what really happened did he think, I wanted his opinion, I should do on this particular video. Mm -hmm. And he did give me some advice and told me to modify certain things, which I will, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, we're still very close. And Louis, we don't know where he is. And Mike Miller died about uh, maybe eight or ten years ago. And of course, Marv and I spoke at the funeral, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. we, were, uh, we were really street guys. Uh, when I say street guys, we, were, we didn't have guns and we didn't rob banks, but we really had each other's back. Mm -hmm. And, you know, breaking into vending machines and whatever. Stealing cartons of cigarettes and certain fights. We spent a good deal of our time in a place called Spinelli's Pool on Flatbush Avenue. Spinelli's, S P I N E L L I, I guess, but at near Erasmus Hall High School. And uh, most of the evenings when we went out, we would end up at a place called Garfield's. Garfield's was a cafeteria on the corner of Church Avenue and Flatbush, directly across the street from Erasmus Hall High School. But I'm jumping ahead a little bit. Anyway, so that's where we we grew up in, in, in that playground, in that park, and we grew up uh, on the streets. Mm -hmm. During the summers, all of us had summer jobs outside the city. Even when we were 13, 14 years old, we, would, we worked either as camp counselors or assistant counselors or, or waiters or busboys. Uh, Louie and I worked as at a, at, up in the Catskills. I was the waiter and he was the busboy. And again, I'm jumping ahead. I'll tell you a story about that. We were at the Pepsi-Cola convention. Pepsi was famous for being a very anti-Semitic uh, company mm -hmm. at that time. And I remember telling Louie that they wanted to hang me and they were going to kill me. And after they killed me, they would go after him because they hated Cubans. <laughs> so I remember they were serving Bosch, you know, red, the red yep. beet soup. Mm -hmm. And they, they were all wearing these white jackets. And Louie holding, I would, I would ladle it out. And Louie just tips it over oh. on Crawford, <laughs> on Joan Crawford and all the people on the dais. Oh, oh shit. Of course, we got fired. <laughs> and of course we didn't get any tips. Then we went to work at a place, it was still not even the summer, it was only June. I think it was our junior year in high school. We went to work in a very, very Jewish place called the Chester Hill Lodge. And this one woman every morning would say to Louie, 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 you're a good boy, but my orange, is, my orange is too cold. You have to leave it out at night. And finally on the last morning, before we get our tips, they leave at noon. She says, Louie, you got it right. It's perfect. It's really perfect. He said, I know. I kept it up my ass all night. Oh, okay. <laughs> But we got fired. Yes. And we lost our tips. Mm -hmm. Okay, Louie. Anyway. Now, you had mentioned Jay Dalton earlier. Yeah, Jay Dalton was the, was, the, was the first friend that I had. And he remained my friend all through the eighth grade. But Jay Dalton somehow disappeared. After the eighth grade, I never heard from him again. I think he went, I think his family moved to New Jersey. And he went to, I think he went to a Catholic high school. Mm -hmm. But I never heard from him again. Yeah. So during the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grades, he was, uh, he hung out with us all the time mm -hmm. with me. It was after the eighth grade that uh, the kids from Huddy, the, on the other side of Forster Avenue, we started to go out at night alone. After we were only 13, 14. Right. But once we hit the 15, literally we used to be out till 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning on a Friday night or a Saturday night. But Jay Dalton wasn't around. Uh, I mean, I, I still have, I, I, you asked for pictures. I still have my uh, eighth grade report card. Ah, okay. I still have a lot of pictures from those days. By the way, yeah. just so you'll know, and if my grandchildren get to see this, my eighth grade report card, all 95s and 100s. Ah, there you That's go. true. <laughs> Honors from the American Legion in history. Excellent. Honors in, uh, in literature and English and all kinds of shit. Mm -hmm. 
And I was a good student. I really didn't earn it because I didn't have to study that hard. Mm -hmm. I have a very good memory to this day, mm -hmm. and that helped. But um, I still saved that. When I, and so anyway, that was the projects. We had a place that we hung out when we were 13, 14 at night. We didn't go to golf fields yet, but we went to a place on Glendale Road. It was a temple, and they had a section called Young Israel. It was on the second floor where there was a jukebox. Mm -hmm. So all the kids our age would go up there, I think three nights a week, even on school nights, and we would dance. And that's the first place that I heard, quote, rock and roll. Ah, Earth Angel. Ah, yes. Oh, man. <laughs> Holy shit. Earth Angel. Doing the fish. Do you know what the fish is? Oh, yeah. That dance, we used to do the fish. Get a heart on every time you do it, you know. <laughs> and then tell the girl, and then you have to bend down a little bit and dance that way. It's a little embarrassing. But a lot of fun. The Young Israel. That was a place we hung out. Um, then we went to high school. Mm -hmm. And by the way, we played softball. We played. We did everything in the park. Mm -hmm. We used to make out on the roof of the projects, bring girl, or go down to the basement. In the basement, you had the bicycle room where the guys would go in there. And there was, I'm not going to mention her name, but there was one girl in the neighborhood who used to give hand jobs. <laughs> and everybody would you know, line up outside this bicycle room. And then they had the orange juice uh, machine, the milk machine, and the cigarette machine. The guys that owned those machines were stupid because we knew how to go in and get all the cigarettes out of the machine, and we even knew how to go in and get the coins out. Ah. But, you know, that's another story. <laughs> well, my father was a giant fan. Uh -huh. Of course, when my father, he didn't know anything about baseball, mm -hmm. because, but he studied it because of we did. My father was a soccer player and a soccer fan, so he used to bring us to soccer games all the time. He hated it. But the Dodgers were... Or gods. Mm -hmm. uh, go, going back to when I was early as when I was five years old. So when Jackie Robinson came along in my neighborhood, that was a very good thing. Mm -hmm. That was actually a great thing. Because remember, the people that I grew up with were very liberal. Very good. This is my wife. This is Will. This is Rita. Hi, Rita. How are you doing? The people that I grew up with would today be called progressive. Mm -hmm. They would be the people that would back Bernie, uh, you know, Bernie's our leader, you know, whatever, Bernie mm -hmm. Sanders. Uh, they were the people that would back the socialists that are running. Mm -hmm. And they were very, very uh, liberal in the sense of, of uh, African Americans being given the same opportunity. Now what they really felt in their heart, I will never know. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't matter. Because I also remember my father telling me, it doesn't matter what's in somebody's heart. It matters how they treat you. Mm -hmm. And I even told that to my wife years ago. When we first started getting serious together, I said, if you don't love me, that's your problem. Mm -hmm. But if you make me think you do, I'm happy. Mm -hmm. So we felt the same way about race and religion. If you treated us right and you were an anti-Semite, that's your problem. Mm -hmm. If you spoke against Jackie Robinson openly, well... That became our problem as well. Mm -hmm. But if you hated him and you spoke nicely about him, fine. Mm -hmm. We couldn't change what was in your heart and mind, but we could change what you said. Mm -hmm. uh, we could fight that. And Robinson was a hero. Yeah. Oh, God, Robinson. You have to remember something about Jackie Robinson that most people don't realize. Jackie Robinson was held back from protest and from acknowledging the hatred. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Ricky told him, you can't do anything for two years. Yep. So Robinson had to eat all that shit. Mm -hmm. But it actually, it only lasted a year. Because he just, I mean, it, was, it was just extreme, massively extreme. Yeah. But it was not so different than what Hank Greenberg experienced as a Jew. Right. Or other Jewish players. But by the time the 50s or late 40s came along, there had been some Jewish heroes mm -hmm. in baseball. And of course, then came Sandy Koufax. But yes, I'm a Dodger fan. Yeah. I still follow the Dodgers. Yeah. When the Dodgers are losing, and she, uh, Echo, tells me that they're losing, I can't watch the game. Yeah. <laughs> I check with her. If the Dodgers are winning, I watch the game. Yeah. <laughs> I still get upset. I remember crying in 1950. Yeah. 
The Dodgers lost the last day of the season to the Phillies on an opposite field home run by that asshole Dick Sisler. <laughs> and then in 1951, the worst possible calamity, Bobby Thompson's home run in the final game, beating the Dodgers. I'll never forget that. And no one ever lets me forget that who's not a Dodger fan. <laughs> but I still hate the Yankees. Sure. Hate them. Yeah. And I hate the Giants. Hate them. And my daughter, by the way, who's paying for this, is now a Giant fan. Uh -huh. Because of, of, uh, of her husband. Uh -huh. <laughs> husband David is from the Bay Area. Right. How could you be a Giant fan? <laughs> uh, there's another incident that happened, I'll tell you, that years, happened years later. It's very interesting. I had a, um, he used to be a radio guy. I can't think of his name. He was on KABC Radio in LA. Ira Fistel had a talk show program. He's from Chicago. And he would always criticize New York fans. Because what the hell do New York people know about baseball? They have no place to play. They, go, they play softball, maybe on concrete, uh -huh. and it is true. There's only one place that I can think of in Brooklyn, the parade grounds, where you can play baseball. Hmm. I mean, other than... Drink? No, thanks. Both soda water, okay. sparkling water. No. So I remember Ira Fisto going on and on about the New York fans booing. And they don't know what they're booing about. So I call the radio program. I wait an hour, and I get Ira Fisto on the radio. I said, Ira, this is Big Dave in L.A. He said, I had called before. And he said, how can I help you? I said, Ira, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right, Ira. You know, the, the guys from Brooklyn like me, we really didn't play hardball baseball. But you're right. How could we know anything about baseball when we put on Channel 5 on the TV and there was Joe DiMaggio in center field, mm -hmm. Mickey Mantle in center field, Johnny Myers at first base, yeah. Phil Rizzuto at shortstop, Yogi Berra catching. <laughs> then we would go to Channel 11 and we would see Wes Westrom, Sal Magley, yeah. Willie Mays, <laughs> Bobby Thompson. Then we would go to Channel 9 and we would see Pee Wee Reese, Duke Snyder, Gil yeah. Hodges, Jackie <laughs> Robinson, Roy Campanella. He said, I got it. I got the yeah. idea. I said, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and that's true. Yeah. That's how it was. Anyway, I digress again. Mm. Uh, so the summers we were out of we were out of the city. The summers we worked we worked at, most of us worked together at a place, a camp called Sussex. Sussex Children's Camp. It was a charity. It was I think a Jewish charity for underprivileged children. It was in New Jersey. And we were counselors there because you know regular camps wouldn't hire us, and that was that. Was, they lived in these the kids lived in bungalows, kind of primitive. But there was a lake, and uh, you were out of the city. Marv worked there. I worked there. Mike Miller, Louis even worked there a couple of years. Uh, that was very that was good. And then after that, we we graduated into really working in real camps and real summer jobs out of the city, waiters or busboys and so on. Mm -hmm. I worked at a place called Colbert Country Club, which had a day camp, and I was the a group leader of uh, six up to eight year, nine year olds. Learned how to play golf, learned how to play tennis, things you would never learn in Brooklyn. How did you spell that, Copac? Copac, how do you spell Copac? C-O, Copac, I guess e -G. E -G. doesn't sound that simple, Copac Country Club. I'll have to look it up and get you the name. I'll look various spellings, but yeah, right. if you need those. Oh, by the way, I'm leaving out something very important. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. After Camp Kindleland, we went there until we were about 10 years old. Then when we moved to the projects, the next camp that we went to during the summers from like age 10 to 14 was a camp called Camp Woodland. Very important, by the way. Camp Woodland? Woodland. Camp Woodland. It was in Phoenicia, New York. Camp Woodland was a camp that was interracial, no interreligious, but it was probably 60 to 65 percent Jewish kids, some black kids, some, some Catholic kids, but you know, and it was again run by the socialist communist uh, group of uh, organizations, unions. And it was very, it was again, a very progressive camp. We all had jobs. 
we had we all had to work in the morning. You worked in the kitchen, or you worked as a painter or a carpenter, and then in the afternoons we, we did what we wanted to do. You played softball, you played baseball. So my first summer romance was the year I graduated from eighth grade at, at, at Camp Woodland, which by the way, I'm mentioning, I'm, I'm brushing it over, but the, the political part it was very instrumental in forging my political beliefs today. Okay. You had people come there perform like Pete Seeger, mm -hmm. who was actually at that time hiding from the uh, Un-American Committee right. in Congress. Mm -hmm. And uh, Pete Seeger was one of my early heroes. Woody Guthrie Jr., people like that. Mm -hmm. uh, very, again, very good. Hello? Not expecting anybody. Mm -hmm. Debbie is a very important part of this conversation. Okay. Debbie will be 60 in February. Okay. Debbie's mother, I married Debbie's mother when she was uh, in her fourth or fifth month of pregnancy. Ah, okay. Uh, Debbie and I have never had that discussion. Debbie's not stupid. She can tell <laughs> And, uh, you know, we've never had that conversation. But there's a whole long story, and I'm going to tell part of that story. Because yes. that, I think, is a significant part of my my early life, my the life now. If you don't mind, let's get into the first year of college. Okay, so the, where do you... Uh, well, let's what, start at the beginning with your birth. What's well, your birthday? I was born on June 7th, okay, 6, 7, 1939. 39. Significant because in September of 1939, the Second World War started. Yes, it did. In September 1939, the world was changed forever. Germans. And, uh, Where were you born? I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Brooklyn, all right. In a part of Brooklyn called Bensonhurst. Bensonhurst, I know. I was born on, uh, actually, I, I think I, about six months we moved to Bay Parkway, 8705 Bay Parkway, which is between Bath Avenue and Benson. Okay. That, now that's Bay Parkway, is that? Three words? Bay? I think it's Bay and the Parkway and is Parkway. Parkway. Okay. Uh, and that's also in New York. And, that's in, in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn, okay. That's in Brooklyn. Excellent. I want to talk about that for a moment. Sure. That uh, structure, that we, that house, that the home that we lived in, was a four-story, kind of looked like a, looked like a brownstone, okay. like the ones in Williamsburg. There were four families on each floor. I think there were 12 Jewish families, four Italian families. That's pretty much what that neighborhood was at that time. Okay. And the Jewish families were all Yiddish-speaking parents who had migrated from mostly from Eastern Europe. Uh, my parents liked them as well. And the uh, children, of course, were mostly the children were born here. To me, that's a significant background because my parents were European. My parents were um, from a small city that started out as Russia mm -hmm. and then became Poland mm -hmm. and then went back to Russia and is now called Belarus, which is the right. city is Pinsk. Okay. And I'm going to say something that's significant. Ever since I was a kid, I've always heard the expression, which is a Yiddish expression, "Alla blata kum from Pinsk," which translated means "all the all the mud comes from Pinsk." And of course, it had double meanings mm. because the city had a river that ran through the middle of it, and that was a standing joke. It took me a while to figure that out. <laughs> but uh, it's a very important to note in this history of my life that I'm the second son brother was three years older than me. My parents spoke only Yiddish at home. Mm. And when they didn't want us to understand, they threw in some Russian and some Polish. 
but my parents were agnostic. They were socialists, and they were very, very strong Zionists. So from the beginning of my life and my brother's life, there was always discussions about religion, uh, politics, uh, philosophy. It was crazy. Uh, people would come to the house, and there was always not just discussions, sometimes arguments. So my brother and I grew up in an atmosphere unlike the atmosphere that my children grew up in, or my grandchildren. And my brother and I are probably the only two Jewish people that you would know who are not bar mitzvahed. Uh, but the tradition in the home was very, very Jewish traditionally. Uh, meaning we, uh, we knew the history of our people my family thought of being a Jew as almost a national, like being Italian or mm -hmm. French. And so we studied the history, we studied the language, we didn't study Hebrew. Uh, I'm mentioning this because it's a very significant part. Mm -hmm. My brother, when he first started school, couldn't speak a word of English. Wow. And he was born in Brooklyn. Uh, he spoke only Yiddish. He had an Italian teacher who had a problem with that, but it took him probably a month to learn how to handle that situation. So by the time I went to school, PS 101 in Brooklyn, I spoke, well, I, I probably could make myself understood with anything I wanted to do as far as going to the bathroom or tying my shoes or I'm hungry. Uh, but still my language, my comfort, my, my mama lush, my mother tongue would have been Yiddish. Now it's pretty tough for me to speak Yiddish unless it's unless someone is very fluent, and then when I speak, it'll flow. Mm -hmm. but it takes a while. I'm mentioning that because that's a very important part of my background. Right. The neighborhood was again, like I say, half Italian, half Jewish. The smells coming out of the Italian home apartments were very similar to the cooking smells that came out of my parents' home. Ah. My father went to school until he was about 12 years old, and he became an apprentice tailor, almost like Fiddler on the Roof story. Mm. Uh, my mother went to uh, school and became a teacher. When she was 18 years old, she went to Warsaw from the small town of Pinsk, uh, where she was the first time she saw a car or things like that. And a year or two later, she came to the United States in 1929. I mention that because this is also very significant, because the very first thing my mother did was sign up for night school. And the very first thing that the night school teacher told my mother was, you're a very fortunate woman. You came here before Christopher Columbus. And it took my mother a while to figure out that my mother arrived in the States on October 11th, <laughs> <laughs> the day before Columbus Day. And I, she always mentioned that, because that, again, is significance when you come in as an immigrant. Mm -hmm. My father actually left Pinsk, I think to avoid going into the service in the Polish army, mm -hmm. him and probably a couple of other hundred guys. And they all went to Argentina, mm -hmm. to Buenos Aires. Uh, did your mother and father know each other in Pinsk? Yeah, yes. Uh my father and mother met at a Zionist movement meeting. My mother was 10. My father was 13. My father was bar mitzvah. My father's family was, most families in Pinsk were orthodox. There was no such thing as conservative or reform at that time. Mm -hmm. My father's father, my grandfather, or my Zaidi, was a uh, religious orthodox Jew. After my father was bar mitzvah, that night, he took off his talus and his yarmulke, put it on the table. He was one of thirteen of uh, nine children, uh, and there were thirteen, but only four, so only nine survived birth, and so on. Uh, he told his father that he could no longer practice the religion, mm. that he wasn't sure there was a god, and that he was going to go the rest of his life and try to find out if there was. Mm -hmm. And he was like basically banned from the house. So for a while, he lived at the, at the um, Histadrut, which was the Zionist movement. A very short while, until they took him back in the house. 
but that's where he met my mother, who was a who was also a Zionist, and they came like boyfriend and girlfriend, or actually, they became friends. Years later, before my father left, they were boyfriend and girlfriend, and my father said to her, "Dvashka, my mother's name is Doris in America, but her name was Dvashka. Dvashka, and he's Abba, like Abba even, Abe. That here he was Abe." He said, wait for me, I'm leaving, but someday I'll find you again. And don't get married, because wait for me. And my father left and went to Buenos Aires. And a year later, my mother came to the States. Never heard from my father. Hmm. Uh, the way the story goes, and I have no reason to doubt it, because other members of the family have told me, that my mother found out that my father was in Buenos Aires through another brother, a younger brother of hers, who went to Buenos Aires instead of coming to the States. He missed that trip. He couldn't go with the rest of the family. And he ran into my father down there and wrote to my mother that he's here. So my mother wrote to him and said, I'm holding you to your promise. <laughs> and she got on a boat and went to Buenos Aires, which is, I think, a five, 6,000 mile trip. Excuse me. And uh, they got married. She remembers always mentioning, my father was completely bald, by the way, when he was 22 years old. Oh, wow. And she mentioned that she saw him wearing this cap when he came to the boat. And she thought he became religious. <laughs> so she said to him, Mr. Frum, are you now orthodox? And he said, took his hat off and he was embarrassed, you know. And he told her that story, which I'm not going to go into. That's it. Story. But they got married, and she tried for 10 months to get him a visa to come back to the States. And this is another part that's significant in my memory. Mm -hmm. She went to the U.S. Council almost every day. I would wait to speak to the U.S. This is the story that we, we know. One day she got there, and he, had, he was out for lunch. And the secretary knew my mother, and they started to talk about love. And my mother explained the story of, of my father to the secretary. And the secretary secretly went into the council's office and stamped my father's passport with the visa. And that's how she got him to come back to the States. All right. And he was the only one of his siblings that ever came to America. Hmm. As a matter of fact, every time there was anything bad that would happen, they would have an argument or something bad would go wrong in the house or he would say to her in Yiddish, I'm not staying here in America. I'm not going to die here. I'm going back to Buenos Aires. <laughs> and she would laugh at him. And uh, of course, that never happened. But none of his siblings ever came here. <laughs> so that's the background of my parents. Uh, my father worked six days a week, left the house at 5.30 every morning, took the subway to a part of Brooklyn called Williamsburg, which is now, quote, gentrified and upscale. In those days, my father had two, two guys meet him at the subway, the elevator train, just to walk the one block to the factory. Mm. It was that dangerous. And my father, would, he was a, uh, he worked in a sewing factory. He started out making $8 a week. Then he worked his way up to foreman and eventually became a partner and eventually got to own the place. Uh, had about a hundred and some odd employees. They worked for a uh, garment company that manufactured woolen Eton suits for boys, a cap, a jacket, a pant, you know. and it was kind of upscale. It sold at places like Lord and Taylor and things like that. He was very proud of that. But he was a contractor for that company mm -hmm. and always wanted my brother and I to stay out of that business. As a matter of fact, he seldom even brought us to the factory. And in the factory, yeah, the employees were uh, Jews like him. European Jews, and Italians. And my father learned to speak Italian almost fluently. Mm. And uh, the people there became almost like extended family. During the summers when we would go away, leave, leaving New York during the summer, a lot of those people that worked for my father, would we would all congregate up in the Catskill Mountains at, at uh, what they called Kukulites, Kukulones, which were bungalow colonies or small hotels. And 
I remember that part of my life very well. It was, it was, it was all like family. And they would all tell stories. How are we doing so far? Oh, great. <laughs> uh, question on the danger. Uh, was that uh, just gangs in general, or was it uh, aimed at Jews or aimed at Italians? No, the, da the danger was that you would be mugged, robbed, and beaten because the area was so poor. Okay. And the area was, at that time, no, there was no, nothing to do with gentrification, if I'm saying that word. It was an it was a black neighborhood, and uh, you'd have garbage. You'd have these garbage cans on the corners with stuff burning in it. Mm. You'd have furniture out in the street, and it was just a yeah, unemployment rate was probably 35, 40 percent. Yeah. And you know, look, if they saw a guy walking in the street who was wearing a decent pair of shoes or a decent pair of pants. He would be robbed, and they'd take the shoes and take the pants. Mm. That actually used to happen. Yeah. So my father had these two guys who worked with him, two really pretty big guys. They went to boys' high school, I remember. They were younger, but they went to boys' high in, in Brooklyn. And they would walk with him that short distance to, the, uh, to what they called the shop, to the factory. Amazing. Now that neighborhood, especially that... Saw a troop in Myrtle near the stop. I think it's called Tompkins there or Myrtle Avenue. I think it's Myrtle Avenue. I would say probably a three bedroom, two bath apartment there now is probably six thousand dollars a month. Oh, okay. it's hard to believe. That. <laughs> Those brownstone buildings were sold to people like me and you just for the back taxes. Hmm. Now they're probably worth sixty to eighty million dollars. Oh wow! These four-story brownstone buildings, because huh. you can get five, six thousand dollars a month rent per floor. Yeah, wow! It's just it's hard. It's hard for me to believe, but that's how it is. Yeah. Anyway, so that's and we we lived in on that eighty-seven oh five Bay Parkway ah, until mm -hmm. I. Re 8705. 8705 Bay Parkway was the address. Perfect. I can't remember the phone number. None of that place. Uh, neighbors, let's see. We had, I'm never going to spell these names. We had Mrs. Susnowich. She was from Krakow. We had Mr. and Mrs. Bromfeld. I don't know how to spell Bromfeld. They were from Minsk, a competition to Pinsk, biggest city. Uh, we had the Weissblatts, and the Weissblatts had a son named Robert. Robert was my closest friend. He lived in the building on the second floor. A little skinny kid, he was younger than me. He had an older brother, Lenny. Very strange. He used to wear these long overcoats. Very strange. It looked like a Hasidic, but he wasn't. And then there was my parents' best friends in the building were Miriam and Lou Ain. Lou was born in Connecticut. Was the only only Jewish guy in the building that wasn't born in Europe, and she was born in England. They were the building was working class, not not upper working class, but working class people. Uh, I the, the most famous guy in the neighborhood. There were four buildings like mine together, with a lot next door. We call it the we called it the lot, and that's where we would play and have rock fights and snowball fights and all that. But the most famous guy in that neighborhood was Bobby Feldman, because his father was the chauffeur for Rick Brandt, Rick, uh, Rick uh, Branch, uh, Branch, Branch Ricky. Branch Ricky. There you go. <laughs> wow. Branch Ricky. And that made him a real, he was a star. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. And uh, so we lived there until, my, my, by the way, my grandparents lived very nearby. My, my mother's father was known as Zadie, which, by the way, now my grandchildren call me Zadie. Uh, Zadie is grandfather in, in Yiddish. He uh, had a little mustache, always wore a hat, a regular hat, not a yarmulke, always had a little vest with a gold chain, and always had a little pocket with a turkey, the turkey from the leg, that he would shine and polish to use as a toothpick. Hmm. Those strands, those strips of the turkey. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. And he would come to the house and he always showed up with a newspaper 
a Jewish newspaper rolled around a fresh fish. He told me he caught the fish. Later on, I found out he would buy the fish. And they would put it in the bathtub, and the fish would swim around sometimes. And uh, was, when they made fish, it was fresh. Anyway, uh, my grandfather died in 1948. Uh, we were not, my brother and I were not allowed to go to the funeral. They thought that was, uh, we were too young. It's silly, but that was the belief that they had. And the, a year later, we moved from 8705 Bay Parkway to we re where we paid $42 a month rent. Mm. It was a two-bedroom, one-bath apartment on the first floor. The living room windows faced Bay Parkway, the street. And my mother was very proud to say that the kitchen had a window. <laughs> she would never take an apartment if there was no window in the kitchen. Uh -huh. And the kitchen window faced the alley in the back. And it was a, the heat in that building came from coal, mm -hmm. which, by the way, now I just thought of this. I'm going to tell you the story. The Italian kids would always invite us to their homes for Christmas to see the Christmas tree and the stockings. And my brother and I one year came to, I must have been six. And uh, we said, how come we don't have a tree? And how come we don't have stockings? You know, mm -hmm. we want it. And my mother said, well, a tree is out. But if you want to put stockings out on Christmas Eve, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Maybe Santa will bring you something. So my brother and I put the stockings out in the living room. We hung it up. We were just, this is fantastic, man, you know. And in the morning when we came down, the stockings were full of coal. Ah, which was a good thing, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. And then, explain, and then we got the idea. You're Jewish. You don't get you know, no, no, no. You get Hanukkah yeah. gifts. You don't get Christmas gifts. That was that was that stands out in my mind. Wow. By the way, my brother. My brother was always like the the one in charge when my if my parents weren't around, but he always had a tremendous fear. To this day, don't get mad at me for saying it, but to this day of being alone. Without someone else in the house. And I didn't count because I was too young. Right. So when my parents had to go out, which was very seldom, by the way, I remember during the war, you had the blackouts. So you had to put mm -hmm. the shades down. And my father was an air raid warden. But once in a while, my mother would have to go to a neighbor who was sick or something. My brother, instead of staying in the bedroom where, we, where, where I was, would put the light on and sit, sit in the bathroom and wait till somebody came home. It's funny how that also sticks out. But well, we had our own room, and we had two twin beds with a little table between us and a radio. And we would listen to the Friday night fights and the ball games, and we would play football between the two beds. And also something I remember is I, 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 I charged at him from my bed to his bed, and he moved out of the way, and my head went through the wall oh, into my geez. parents' bedroom. <laughs> Again, that sticks out. Something else that, re that sticks out about 8705. In 1944, I had my tonsils out. And we went back to Dr. Becker. And as we were crossing the street to Dr. Becker's office, I let go of my mother's hand and I ran out into the street. Oh, and I got hit by a car. Hmm. And the car dragged me at more than 100 feet. Holy cow. The guy was an 86-year-old veteran of the First World War who said he didn't see me, and I broke my leg. Mm. That was on May 10th, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. This is a strange story. Well, I recovered from that, whatever, of course. Now, four years later, no, no, it's, yeah, 1940, no, 1947, so three years later, on Three years later, on Lincoln's birthday, there was a snowstorm. And my brother and I were sleigh riding on some guy's property. The guy was a World War II vet who came back with some psychological problems and got pissed off that we were on his property mm. and chased us off and actually picked me up and threw me against a tree and I broke my arm. That was on Lincoln's birthday. That night, my brother convinced me not to tell anybody that I had the broker, even though the bone was showing through. Oh. 
he wrapped it up with tape. And of course, it, my parents found out sometime during yeah, the night. Yeah, it is. I must have been screaming. <laughs> And uh, so they took me to the doctor again, and my father would always say, this, this kid is a jinx, he's an umlut. <laughs> an umlut means bad luck, he's following you. And I'm telling you this because I got the cast off on May 10th that year. Hmm. So I didn't go to school. So I went to play with the kids who were not in kindergarten yet, and they were playing Tarzan. They were jumping from a, from a little fence onto a tree. So of course I did the same thing fell on the ground and broke my leg. Oh. <laughs> Just around 2 o'clock. It's amazing. And every May 10th to this day, I, I shit. I can imagine. I don't. <laughs> I still, but nothing has happened since. Oh my. Good luck. Uh, and of course, I went to the hospital and so on and so forth. Mm. It was okay from that. All right, so now we move. In 1949, we, uh, we left... 8705 Bay Parkway, and we really went big time. Well, now wait, oh, wait a minute, 8705 Bay Parkway was the first place that yes. you said you moved from there to another place, but you didn't mention well, I the was, street. No, when I was born, I don't remember the street that I was born on. Okay. I was there for six months, Okay. and then my parents moved to 8705 Bay Parkway. Got it. And I stayed there from age one to uh, 1949, so I was 10. And they moved during the summer so that I wouldn't miss any of school. My brother at that time was going to Lafayette High School. My brother was a good guy. Uh, he, my brother was always very proud of me. Uh, we were very different. Uh, my brother was, was always had a, he became a scientist, he became a chemist, he, he's a graduate chemist. And he had that kind of mind, he would always make puzzles and build model airplanes. Mm -hmm. And I would break them up and destroy them. <laughs> What's your brother's name? Victor. Victor. Okay. My, I, am the, I, am the, I am named after a grandparent on my father's side who was Yale, like the college, Yale David. Yale uh -huh. David. And my brother is named after another grandparent on, on that side named Victor Zelik. And that's his name, Victor Zelik. Okay. Uh, he was a good student, but he was also, he was also a good guy. And he really didn't give my parents any problem at all. But years and years later, when my wife spoke to my mother about me, my mother would always say, when Vicky was born, everything was perfect. Life was wonderful. That was three years, and then along came. They called, my family calls me Dubby, not David. And, and uh, then along came Dubby, and everything changed. He was crazy, he was bad, he would fall off the crib and he would this. And I've had that reputation. Mm -hmm. I'm smiling because <laughs> they, they say it with a smile. Mm -hmm. Arum -gluck. bad luck. All right, so now we move, to, uh, we move to Vanderveer. The name of the place is called Vanderveer, V-A-N-D-E-R-V-E-E-R, -E -E I guess. Mm -hmm. Vanderveer States Projects. It was a project. Okay. I think it was a combination of government and, and private funding or union funding. But it was a three-bedroom, one-bath apartment okay. for $132. Wow. Wow. And you were 10? Excuse me? You were age 10 then. I was 10. My brother was 13. Okay. By the way, I want to just go back. During the years between time when I was eight years old until I was 10 or 11, during the summers, my brother and I attended a camp called Kinderland, K-I-N-D-E-R-L-A-N-D. -E mm -hmm. it, it was upstate New York on a place called Sylvan. I wouldn't even know how to spell Sylvan. Maybe that's the yes. S-Y-L-V-A-N. Maybe. Sylvan Lake. <laughs> and right across from us was another camp that was run by the Workmen's Circle. Now, the Workman's Circle was a uh, Jewish camp, Workman's Circle. No, the Workman's Circle was not just Jewish, Jewish and Italian, but a lot of the officers were Jews, and everybody considered them to be ultra-liberal. My parents considered them to be almost like fascists, <laughs> because Camp Kinderland was really pink. I mean, more than pink, it was probably most of the people that ran the camp were either communists or leaning that way. Uh. 
My parents were never members of the Communist Party, by the way. They always were very, ha very careful to tell me that. Mm -hmm. But in the neighborhood that we lived in Bensonhurst, there were a lot of really strong communist feelings and socialist feelings. And we grew up around that atmosphere. And my parents purchased their funeral plots through an organization called the IWO, International Workers' Organization. Mm -hmm. And the leadership of that organization were all, all communists, I'm sure. I have to mention something else. One of the highlights of, of my early years was at Passover. The rest of my family was religious. I mean, some no, some of the members, when my grandfather was still alive, when my Zadie was alive, he would conduct what they called a Seder, the Passover Seder. And everybody would dress up and come there. It was a very joyous time. And that's when I would spend time with my oldest cousin, whose name is David, David Lieberman. His father was my favorite uncle, Uncle of Rembrandt. Uncle of Rama was my, is my, was my mother's oldest brother. She really didn't know him very well until she came to America, because he left for America when he was like 13 or 14. And he's probably 10 years old. He was 10 years or more older than her. So he came here with my grandfather, and they worked in Coney Island building that uh, roller coaster. Anyway, David was 12 years older than me. And I mention you this because to this day, David, by the way, is the one I spoke to who told me about his son. Mm. David is 91, and I remember at one of the seders, David had just come back from the milk from the army from the Second World War, and he used to have his uniform on. He looked great, and he was like my hero. And I remember him telling me, Dovey, I am now 12 years older than you. I'm double your age. <laughs> I am double your age. I must have been 12 or something. So it can't be that we must have moved already. But next year, you're going to start catching up to me. <laughs> I never could, I could, it took me a while to figure that out. But he's still 12 years old, and I keep telling him, I don't want to catch up to you, David, so stay with us. I told him that again today. But the Satyrs were very, the whole family would get together. It was very, they would sing, the men would sing in Yiddish and in Hebrew, and they would drink. And by the way, when they drank, they only drank at home. Mm -hmm. My, my, all my uncles, my parents' friends, they drank at home. They drank out of uh, jelly jars that were clean, and they drank without ice, without water in the liquor. They drank either Lord Calvert, if it was a cheap night, mm -hmm. or Canadian Club. Yeah. And uh, they would eat, they would play Pinochle. That was a big thing. And they would eat herring, real herring, and, and boiled potatoes. Mm. Those were their lit box. Among the Jews, you have different breakdowns. And Litvaks are the ones that mostly come from Eastern Europe, from Russia and Poland and uh, whatever. Anyway, I remember the boiled potatoes and Harry. All right, so now we're into the Van der Veer Estates projects. Mm -hmm. was, I believe it's 55 buildings now, six stories, each one, eight families per floor. We moved into the very first building. It still had the scaffolding up mm. in 1949. That, the address was uh, 1355 New York Avenue, between Newkirk Avenue and Forster. The IRT subway stop was two blocks away, was Newkirk Avenue subway stop. The school was PS 89. Built, I guess, probably around 1870. Had a swimming pool, by the way. Strange. Strange as it may seem to you now, I was the only Jewish kid in that school. Wow. It was a school that went to the sixth grade. It was all Irish, Italian, and some other mixtures, but it was all, uh, there were no, I was the first Jew in that school. Hmm. And unfortunately, I never, I had never experienced anti-Semitism before, and it's very, that's also a very important part of my psyche now. Mm -hmm. uh, I had my shirt taken off and, and with a cigarette burned in Jew in my oh, back. Geez. I was stabbed by a guy named Marshall Zipper. Luckily, I was wearing my brother's leather, leather jacket. He never forgave me for that. <laughs> so the knife only went into my body a little bit. But I remember my mother coming 
to school with her heavy accent, complaining about anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And Mrs. Campbell said to my mother, in beautiful English, if you don't like it here, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Winnick, well, why don't you go back where you came from? Right. But as, what was the composition of PS 101? PS 101 was Italian and Jewish. Okay, so there was, oh, everybody got along there. Everybody got along there. Uh, everybody got along. There was, uh, we, uh, even the teachers that were not Jewish or the kids that were not Jewish, they were, I, I mean, I may have been too young to realize it. Maybe my brother felt it, but I, I doubt it. Mm -hmm. And then my brother went to Lafayette. Lafayette High School was probably, again, 60% Jewish, 40% Italian. Mm -hmm. Or maybe the opposite way around. Right. Uh, but PS 101 never experienced any. I never experienced any of that anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, something just jumped into my head that I have to tell you about. Mm -hmm. At 8705 Bay Parkway, there was a temple right across the street, a, sh a synagogue. And my brother and I also, the same way we questioned Christmas, we also questioned the Jewish holidays. Because a lot of the Jewish kids would dress up. Well, we would dress up, by the way, but we never went to temple. And we, I remember we said to my father, you know, why are we, what's going on? And my father explained to us that uh, he didn't believe that uh, praying was going to save anybody. He believed that nothing changed without some violence and nothing changed without protest and that praying to God was not what was going to save the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And he would always use as an example the Warsaw Ghetto. Right. Even he told us this when we were six, seven years old, that the, the religious Orthodox Jews were huddled in the, in the sewers, mm -hmm. praying for God to save them. And the socialist, agnostic, and the communist, atheist Jews were out there with pit, pitchforks and hammers and guns if they can get it, mm -hmm. and were fighting the Nazis. Mm -hmm. And uh, he felt that was the way to be sure that the Jewish people would survive. Mm -hmm. So we, had, we went to the temple that day, and he wanted us to go in. It was on Yom Kippur, and they were going to sing Kol Nidra. Kol Nidra is a hymn that you sing at New Year. My father used to sing it when he was shaved part of his life, you know, and he, he, we all wanted to go. He wanted us to see it. And the guy at the door said, no, you don't have a ticket and you can't come in. Mm -hmm. And I remember my father telling him, that is the most un-Jewish thing anybody can ever do, refusing other Jews from mm -hmm. coming into a temple. Yeah. And again, that was something that uh, stayed, that stayed with us. Mm -hmm. I was going to tell you something else about that particular event, but I can't remember what it was. So that 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 happened, and we under and we uh, we understood. And he told us that if, when we grow up, if we want to go, we go. If you don't, you don't. Oh yes. When we asked him what it, what it meant to him to be a Jew, and you don't pray, Dad, you don't go to temple. I mean, so why do you call yourself a Jew? Mm -hmm. And he said, my job, and hopefully your job, and he meant this, would be to stand in front of this temple with a machine gun, if necessary, to allow those Jews inside to pray. Mm -hmm. That's your job. That's my job. And my brother and I never really forgot that. That stayed with us to this day. Mm -hmm. And we actually became very intolerant, at least I did, uh, of any anti-Semitic activities. Unfortunately for me, I go from zero to ten, so I do become violent mm -hmm. and have many, many times when it comes to anti-Semitism. My brother is a little calmer and probably more scientific about it, <laughs> more careful. Anyway, so now we're over at, at uh, 1355 New York Avenue. My brother is commuting that first year back to Lafayette High School, which was probably a one-hour commute by bus. And I was in PS 89. My first friend in that neighborhood was uh, Jay Dalton. Jay Dalton, who I think was, uh, came from a Danish background, I'm not sure, a, a Christian, but definitely not an anti-Semite, at least not him, maybe his family was. Very nice kid. 
And as the, as the projects began to build out, more and more Jews moved in. So by the time I got to the sixth grade, seventh grade, let's say there were five or six Jewish kids in the school. By the seventh grade, uh, the school had probably 10%, maybe 15% of the kids were Jews. The anti-Semitism actually got worse mm -hmm. as more and more Jews moved into the neighborhood. There were two churches that were very prominent. One was St. Jerome's. St. Jerome's was where most of the Italians went. That was on the corner of Nostrand Avenue and New York. The other church was St. Vincent's, where most of the Irish went. And the Irish and the Italians, I mean, literally, would take every chance they could to kill each other. Yeah. I mean, beating the shit out of each other. It was just unbelievable. But the local gang, the Italian local gang, was a gang called the Flatbush Tigers. Mm. They had divisions. They had the seniors. The, 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 they had the Flappers Tigers, then you had Tiger Seniors, Flappers Tigers, and Flappers Tigers Juniors. Mm. And uh, the juniors were up to age like 13, 14. So my brother and I were involved with the Flappers Tiger Juniors. And I remember they would come to the neighborhood sometimes in these things that looked like army trucks with the canvas on the back and load, load six, seven trucks up with guys going to have, quote, a gang fight. Most of these gang fights never happened because somebody smart enough would call the police. <laughs> I remember once at Holy Cross Cemetery, uh, luckily the police did get there because there had to be four or five hundred guys on each side of that. Terrible. And it was so bad that it's hard to believe that in Brooklyn, St. Jerome's had a court, like a schoolyard that had a gate on one side of the street, and the other street had a gate. So these Irish kids blocked both exits to that schoolyard with cars. And they came in and broke up the church and broke up the carnival mm. and the rides. It was terrible. And then, of course, the Flappers Tigers reciprocated. And sometimes I would, I, I, I venture to say, I, I would think that sometimes people maybe you know, died. I'm not sure. I remember stories about them throwing them off the Marine Parkway Bridge and shit like that. But um, I don't remember guns. I remember somebody making a zip gun, and that was a big thing. But they did have axe handles, and the axe handles had razor blades mm. all around them. Wow. So it was very scary. But the Jewish kids drifted toward the Italian kids. Again, their parents didn't speak English. The smells coming out of their house was their pasta basul smelled like my mother's beans. Mm -hmm. And somehow there was, there was no love, but there was somehow a kinship. Mm -hmm. And to this day, some of those Italian kids that I grew up with in PS89, I'm still in contact with. Mm -hmm. Guys like Vinnie Gargano and a lot of guys. But I can remember the Big Paradise. Uh, they, were, they were the old, they were the real Flappers Tigers. And they were heroes to me because they treated me right, you know, mm -hmm. they treated my brother right. Uh, and unfortunately, I hope you're not Irish, but there's always been a bad feeling toward the Irish. Uh, Sorry. No, I'm, you, I'm a Scotsman. There you go. <laughs> well, so you feel the same way? Yes. <laughs> to a certain extent. <laughs> Funny, isn't that amazing? But I tell that to people now, they say, why? They just don't get what New York was. Mm -hmm. That when the Irish controlled New York and the Italians began coming over. It's the same situation as you hear now. People talk about Mexicans, mm -hmm. the same way they talked about Jews or whatever. Yeah. Terrible. Which is really amazing uh, because that, that kind of characterized the 50s in particular. Uh, and you would think that there would have been more sympathy for them coming out of the war. It's like, you know, we knew by then how bad things had been. You'd think there'd be a little more love. Yeah, you would think there would be a little more love. Well, just let's put it this way. Wouldn't you think there would have been a little more respect for, quote, niggers? One would hope, but... Uh, yeah. African Americans, Negroes, yeah. that they were still niggers, yeah. as far as they were concerned. Yeah. And when they came back, after heroically, literally, heroically fighting for this country, yes. they had arrived the back of the bus. Yep. Now just imagine how you would feel. Yeah. My parents talked about that uh, uh, probably every day. Mm -hmm. Every day there would be an example 
of what you should not allow happen. Because if it happens to a black kid or an Irish kid or a French kid, it will eventually happen to you. Yep. So any kind of prejudice, I mean, it was banged into our head, mm -hmm. my brother and I. Any kind of racism or prejudice, you have to fight. Mm -hmm. Now, my mother would say, you have to fight it intellectually. And you have to just, my mother was very calm. She lived to be 94 years old. And uh, I don't think I ever heard her really scream. Uh, she screamed at me a couple of times. But she was very, very intelligent, very calm. I knew what was going on, and my father was very volatile. <laughs> but now again, I have to tell you a story about that. I'm jumping ahead, I'm sorry, but, mm -hmm. I, but the story hits me now. I was always a little embarrassed about the fact that my parents really couldn't speak English very well. My mother wasn't too bad, but when she wrote, it, it came out really, the grammar was terrible, mm -hmm. and my father was even worse. So I remember my father would write me letters sometimes when we were at camp during the summers. And, and I would read those letters and the kids would laugh. And instead of getting upset, I would also think it was funny. And, and then it would bother me that, why am I laughing at my father like that? And mm -hmm. I was a little embarrassed. Well, I roll the clock ahead, now I'm getting married. And I have to, and my parents have to meet my future wife's parents. Both my future wife's parents had gone to college in America. They were born in America. Mm. Jack Blodstein graduated from Alabama. He was from Brooklyn, but he got a boxing scholarship to Alabama. Mm. And, and uh, my, my future wife's mother had gone to uh, City College. I don't know if she ever graduated. But now my parents are going to meet them for the first time. Very embarrassing. My father comes in, my mother comes in. And Jack Blonstein is trying to impress my father. He's wearing, actually wearing this moron. He's wearing a smoking jacket. I shouldn't say moron. Erase that. <laughs> this very handsome, by the way. Movie star. Movie star handsome. My father was five foot five, 134 pounds, and completely bald. Definitely not movie star <laughs> handsome. And uh, he, he said he offered my father a drink. Again, I told you, my father, when they drank, you know, they drank from the tea, from the, the jelly jar. Mm -hmm. And he gives them a shot in a shot glass. My father looked at me, I said, Dad. And then Jack began to say, you know, Abe, this situation that we're in, we're in reminds me of something from Tolstoy. I got my head down. Mm -hmm. And he says, oh, Abe, I'm sorry. Maybe you didn't have the opportunity to read Tolstoy. And my father said to him, well, to tell you the truth, Jack, I read it in Russian. It was very, very good. That's the original language. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I read it in Polish. Not so good, but good. <laughs> then when I went to Argentina, I read it in Spanish. Also, not so great. Of course, I read it in Hebrew, naturally. And uh, in Yiddish, it was wonderful. Wonderful. But you're right. In English, I had a little problem. <laughs> hey, go get him. Yeah. <laughs> and Jack looked at me, looked at my father, and that subject never came yeah. up again. <laughs> yeah, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I had to throw that in. <laughs> anyway, we're now at, Pete, we're now at 1355 uh, New York Avenue. Nice. We thought it was heaven. Mm -hmm. And about a block away on Forster Avenue was a place called the, uh, the, the park. Called the park? The playground. The playground. No, not the park. The playground. And Mac was the, uh, I guess, the director. Wore a uniform. You had basketball courts. You had a softball court on concrete. You had tennis courts. You had swings. And, I mean, it was, it was paradise compared to where we were before. And uh, that's where we played basketball. By the way, in PS 89, when I got to the seventh grade, one of the kids that came in behind me is someone whose name you'll recognize, Barbara Streisand. Oh, wow. She lived in the projects. Barbara was the girl in the neighborhood who had a party for every reason. Mm -hmm. Columbus Day, Thanksgiving, and we would play spin the bottle. 
and I'm not saying this, most people that know me know this story and know this. She would stare at me for hours. She had this strange, she was a very strange girl. She, when she was 13 years old, she worked at a Chinese restaurant. She had her eyes pulled all the way back. She did it, I don't know how she did it, and she wore these Chinese outfits. And we all hold them. She couldn't speak Chinese, anymore, but she would do that. She's very funny. Ugly as sin. Really ugly. And uh, I avoided her every way I could. <laughs> she went to Erasmus. We were, in, we were in a choral group together. I'm going, can I roll ahead a little bit? Sure. sure. Years and years later, she's very famous. Of course, she's Barbara Streisand. And I had already moved to California. And some of my friends that lived in my area where I lived, worked for the William Morris Agency. Mm -hmm. One guy in particular, a guy named Rob Heller. Very nice guy. I hope he's still alive. And we went to the uh, Hollywood Bowl to mm -hmm. see her perform. And these guys had their own box. You know, had, so we sat with them in the box. And one of the guys said, you know, David, I heard you, you know Barbara. And I said, uh, yeah, you know, I haven't had contact with her for many years. And they said, well, I wonder if you would arrange Maybe you could ask her if we could come backstage, either during intermission or after the show, and just kind of chat. We'd like to represent her. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, okay, sure. So they call over one of the ushers, and I give, and, and I, I write on the um, playbill, whatever the thing from the Hollywood Bowl, mm -hmm. hi Barbara, and I spell it right, B-A-R, you know, Barbara. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. It's Dovey from Vanderveer. Uh, I'm outside with some people. They'd like to meet you. Can we come backstage? She wrote, I'm not exaggerating, fuck you, where were you when I needed you? Oh, <laughs> I still have it. I'm not going to show it to you, but I have it somewhere in the garage. Everybody knows the story, by the way. <laughs> Years later, I saw her at Dodger Stadium, and I couldn't resist. I'm like, Barbara, it's Dobby. And she went, <laughs> <laughs> And strange that now that I mention that, years later after that, you, you know Lady Kazan. You've heard of yeah, Lady Kazan? Sure. Lady Kazan also went to our high school, the same high school. Mm -hmm. And Lady is a year older than, well, two years older than Barbara. But she was Barbara's understudy in, two of the, in Funny Girl, mm -hmm. and I Can Get It For You Wholesale. And Lady became famous on Dean Martin's show right. and making movies. Well, I was I had almost the same experience with Lady. We were very we were very close in high school. Hmm. And they were honoring her at in Beverly Hills at the New York City High School reunion. Every year they would honor Mickey Rooney. Somebody from New York. Mickey Rooney, by the way, is from Brooklyn. Hmm. And they were so that year they were honoring Lady Kazan. So I happened to have a yearbook from her her year of graduation, which was nineteen fifty six. I graduated in 57. I don't know how I got that yearbook. I think my daughter gave it to me from some printer. So I remember we used to have, before the show, the show was a four-hour show in the theater at Beverly Hills High School. But before that, we would all meet in the parking, in the playground, or parking lot, and it would be by high school. Erasmus, Jefferson, this, that. And you'd have all these, you'd sign up. And it was fantastic to have the Nathan's hot dogs. And so I approached Lainey, with that 1956 yearbook with my wife. And I say, Lainey, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, not Dovey, it's David. She goes, oh, hi. Oh, hi, she goes, yeah. I said, I, you know, you forgot to sign the yearbook at graduation. And she says, get that fucking thing away from me. Get that fucking <laughs> thing away from me. Are you crazy? I couldn't figure I said, no. So I turned around. My wife said, she put, no one maybe knows how old she is. I said, okay. So I went and I told that story to everybody in the school. Mm -hmm. how she pushed me aside. And then, when they were introducing her three hours later on the stage, the guy that introduces her said, oh, we have a surprise for Lainey. The um, president of Hofstra University is here to give her an honorary diploma for 1960, class of 1960. So I said, wait a second, if she was so upset with me oh. for the 56 yearbook, how would she allow this? Mm -hmm. And then as she explained it to me the next year, when I was sitting on the, I had already lost my sight, she knew that. She came over as she was, this is a year later, and she knelt down right in front of me. She said, David, it's not the age, it's 
it's the fucking face. Ah, she yeah. had all that work done. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and the yearbook picture showed the nose and the lips. Oh, wow. So we figured that out. I had to throw that in. Anyway, we're back to uh, 1949, and the neighborhood is the, the playground is where we hung out. Mm -hmm. There was a candy store on the corner of Forster and Nostrand. And the candy store, do you know what a candy store means to in Brooklyn? Do you have any idea? I picture? do, yes. Okay. You know, they have the newspaper stand outside. Mm -hmm. Inside you have maybe four uh, swiveling chairs with a soda fountain. And then it sells yeah. everything from comic books to uh, little candies. And yeah. I, w I would work there set on Sunday morning setting up the paper. Because when they would drop the, the Times or the news, they would drop it off in sections. And you had to put the paper together. And we worked behind the counter. We stole. We stole cigarettes. We stole. <laughs> got around that place. Got ripped off by all of us. But we really learned a lot in that schoolyard, in that in that schoolyard, in that playground. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm reminding you, take pills. I gotta take my pills. Yep. I gotta take the Parkinson pills. Okay. Am I going on too long with no, this? No, not at all. No. Camp Woodland, uh, Camp Woodland, and Seager, politics, and Seager, Seager and, and Woody, and we learn. Uh, by the way, most of the kids, I was surprised to find out years later, came from upper middle class families. Mm -hmm. My brother and I were probably one of the few uh, kids who came from working class parents. These progressive young socialists were. Uh, their families did very well. Mm -hmm. So that myth that uh, only poor people or working class people could be progressive mm -hmm. is stupid mm -hmm. and wrong, of course. Uh, many of them were from Manhattan, from, you know, went to private schools. But I, my girlfriend was Abby Duval. I'm mentioning that because I'm still in contact with Abby Duval. Oh, wow. Abby Duval was 15, I was 14. Mm -hmm. She was actually going into college. She was going to be 16 that winter, and she was way ahead. She went to Bennington on an art scholarship, and she still practices. She's still an artist. She still has shows. As a matter of fact, recently, as a couple of weeks ago, uh, we got an invitation to one of her shows. We're still in touch. She had red hair. I call her Red. She calls me Dovey, and we're, uh, we're still in touch. It was never, I mean, it was a summer holding hands, kind of maybe making out a little bit. Lasted? Lasted. All, but we, we lost track for a while, but mm -hmm. reconnected. And we're both, uh, we're both still those same kids that went to Camp Woodward. All right. In terms of our politics, mm -hmm. I, may be, I may be a little more uh, realistic than some of them. Some of them are still, they believe they're going to change the world. They're not going to change mm -hmm. anything. Anyway, so uh, that's what, that's what my, my brother was injured in camp when he was, uh, I think, going on 14 that summer. He dislocated his hip, which affected his life even to this day. It was after that, it was really the surgery was very bad at that in those days. And he was taking pain pills mm. and aspirin and all kinds of shit. And it destroyed his kidneys. Mm. So th those boxes that you see up against that wall mm -hmm. arrived yesterday. My brother is coming here on the 10th of uh, July. He does dialysis every day at home, wow. not on a machine and not going out. It's a new way of doing it. Huh. You do it. It's done by gravity. You have a tube that's connected to your stomach. Anyway, he so this is what he uses to stay alive. Wow! But it's not a machine. He doesn't want to be on a machine. Mm -hmm. So he'll be here for about that. My brother still owns a home. He owns a home in this area, and he's close with Debbie. I mean, they they they, they get along. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we come to. Uh, High school. Okay. I started high school as a freshman. The year I started, that June, before, so I started in September. My brother left high school that June, graduated from Erasmus. Ah, okay. My brother ran for what they call Joe Erasmus, the typical Erasmian. <laughs> he didn't win, but he should have. Brother was a very, very handsome guy. I'll show you the pictures. Still is. Mm -hmm. And I come in my very first day. Literally, I have a French teacher named Mrs. Titcomb, of all things. My brother used to talk about Mrs. Titcomb. How do you keep a straight face? Yeah, you don't do that. And Erasmus Hall High School 
was built in 17-something. And the building we were in were built in the early 1800s. Wow. So they had these huge windows. The, the, the ceilings were maybe 40 feet high in some of the classrooms. And you had these huge windows and you had these poles to open the windows. So she's calling the roll and she goes, Winnick, can I hear? I thought I got rid of you. <laughs> I said, Mrs. Titko, that was my brother. <laughs> oh my God, I hope you're not as bad as he was. My brother couldn't pass French, just couldn't. <laughs> and she said, do something useful. Take the pole and open the window. And I was so nervous, I broke the whole window. Oh, jeez. That's how it started. <laughs> Went downhill from there. Now, I was a good high school student, but I got hurt in my freshman year, and I was out of school for about three months. I hurt my back. Uh, to this day, it's a problem, my pelvic, the, the back. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that year, I had a friend from the projects named Lois Schmitzky. Still, I, we're still in contact also. Lois never was a girlfriend. She always dated all the guys. But she would bring my work home every day, and uh, I did my work, but I ended up with like a 75 average for that freshman, that first part of my freshman year. Mm -hmm. And the rest of my time at Erasmus, I averaged in the high 90s. You know, I did very well. I was a student council for eight, eight uh, terms in a row. Right. I was uh, on the junior varsity basketball team. Remember, we had almost 8,000 students at Erasmus. Mm -hmm. Many of our teams in basketball went to all city, went to the state uh, city championships. We had a very good basketball team. I couldn't make the first team, but I, I played junior varsity. Mm -hmm. And I was in the choral group for four years, again with Laney and Barbara, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I was also, when I, I'm very proud to say when I graduated, I was handsomest boy in the graduation I class. <laughs> and I'll show you those pictures too. Uh, here's where it gets a little complicated. On October 12th, in my sophomore year, at a football game, I met my future-to-be high school girlfriend. Her name is Elaine. This is the part of this tape that I wasn't sure how to handle. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to modify it. Elaine and I had more than just a boyfriend-girlfriend. I mean, it was a, uh, there was really a connection. Mm -hmm. She had, her mother was divorced and remarried, and she had a younger brother, eight years younger than her. And she never felt a connection with her father. She was always very insecure about that. And somehow, I made her feel important. She was not, by, uh, by most standards, pretty, although I thought she was. But most people didn't, they thought she was kind of plain, but I thought she was pretty, mm -hmm. very smart, very funny, smoked a little too much, but we both did. And um, we were in love. But even more than that, we had a, we had a certain friendship, a bond. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did not date anyone ever in high school other than Elaine. Mm -hmm. Neither did she, except for one problem. Uh, during our sophomore year, we were making out in her room her bedroom. Nothing serious, but her mother, her mother was a school teacher. It was during what they call Regents Week. And her mother came home early and caught us in that. <laughs> and I was banned. Oh. <laughs> so for the next three years, uh, we would have to sneak around, which made it even yeah, more exciting. Yeah, actually, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. I, we'd have guys pick her up, and it was all kinds of stories. And I'd have guys bring her home, and her father would hide in the back and see if I was coming. And but it was a very strong relationship. Mm -hmm. I speak to Elaine now, if not once every week, but once every couple of weeks, mm -hmm. with the full um, knowledge that my, my wife knows, mm -hmm. and uh, she encourages him. Mm -hmm. Of course, for years, we didn't speak. And when we did, it was always like, yeah, can't talk. Uh -huh. It was always because didn't, she didn't want to hurt her husband, and mm -hmm. I didn't want to. And then finally, my wife says to me, what the hell are you doing? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not that insecure. You, can, if you want to talk to her, talk to her. Mm -hmm. What's the problem? So we do speak at least once every, every week or once every couple of weeks. To mm -hmm. this day, uh, Elaine went on to uh, 
Boston, Boston University. And I could not matriculate at Brooklyn College because of that first six months. Mm. My average came out to like 89 point something. Mm. And you needed at least a 90 to matriculate at Brooklyn College. Wow. So she went to Boston. I, uh, by the way, she used to work at a camp near Copen. So I would visit her during the summers at her camp on her day off. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was just a, it was David and David Lane, that's mm -hmm. what it was. And um, her parents found out that she was still seeing me and they threatened to stop paying for her school. Oh, wow. So one thing led to the next and she told me she couldn't see me anymore and whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a friend at that time, an acquaintance named David Trackman, who was my future wife's very close friend. His girlfriend was having a sweet 16. Linda didn't have a date. She had just broken up with her boyfriend, and I had just broken up with Elaine. So David fixed me up with Linda. Mm -hmm. Linda was beautiful. I mean, to this, Debbie's mother. To this day, she's still very pretty, but I'm talking she was movie star mm -hmm. beautiful. Again, I showed you, to ask Debbie to show you pictures, you won't believe it. Mm -hmm. uh, dark hair, just, just beautiful. And we went out casually uh, during one of those casual evenings. Then they got pregnant. I, uh, she told me she was pregnant. And I said, okay, you know, we'll, we'll deal with it. No problem. You know, we'll do whatever we have to do. She then told me that she wasn't. And she said, now you'll probably never want to see me. I may take this out later on. Mm -hmm. She said, now you may never want to see me again because now I'm not pregnant. And I said, that's not true. At the end of the summer, we'll get together. I'm working in camp during the summer, but I'll see you. But actually, in some ways, I was relieved. Mm -hmm. And then Elaine came back into the picture. A mm -hmm. uh, couple of months later, near the end of the summer, Linda called me to tell me that she had lied, that she never had a period, and that uh, she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. And the rest is history. I sent my friend Louie to tell Elaine that I was getting married that following week. Mm -hmm. Her parents had arranged, somebody canceled the wedding at a place called uh, uh, Ocean Parkway Jewish Center on Ocean Parkway. That, so they slipped our wedding in. I notified a few people. It was a very heavy decision for me what to do. But the bottom line was, I did not, under any circumstances, want anyone to raise my child but me. Right. I didn't want to have it. There was, it was never any thought of abortion. There was never any thought of, on my part of adoption. Mm -hmm. And I figured, the worst comes to worst. For hundreds and hundreds of years, people got married through arranged marriages. Mm -hmm. That love was important, but love would come. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would... Uh, we would make it. I was eight, she was 17, I was 18. When Debbie was born, I was 19. And I think her mother had just turned 18. Or, mm -hmm. or maybe I just turned, yeah, I think I just turned 18. Uh, this part I may take out as well, mm -hmm. because Debbie gets crazy when she hears this part. Mm -hmm. Debbie was born with a, with a very bad heart defect. She refuses to discuss that. Mm -hmm. Linda always felt that maybe that was her punishment. She doesn't admit it now, but she used to tell me then that for what we did. Debbie was not supposed to survive more than a year. She was a blue baby, mm -hmm. lips and everything. And in those days, she had what they call a patent doctor's hole in the back of her heart. Mm -hmm. And her heart was filling up with all kinds of bad stuff. But there was this one doctor who was doing surgery at that time. His success rate was 30% with, with children. And he said that she could live maybe 18 months, but we needed to have that surgery. But in those days, Blue Cross and Blue Shield did not cover prenatal injuries mm -hmm. or conditions. So we had to pay for it ourselves. Mm -hmm. I knew that was going to be a problem, but I, I gave the guy bad checks. And anyway, the bottom line is that we had the surgery. Debbie was packed 
you got to picture this. She doesn't know that she was 18, 19 months old. Maybe she still does know. She was packed in ice and frozen to slow down her heart rate because they didn't have a heart lung machine. Mm -hmm. And they, they connected her to, and they, they did that surgery on her heart. The guy came out, this asshole of a doctor came out, covered with blood. Mm -hmm. That was his method. By the way, he later on had a nervous breakdown and was institutionalized. Mm -hmm. And two of his children were institutionalized, asshole. And uh, came out and said, well, she'll either make it or she won't, but you're young enough to have more kids. Oh, jeez. <laughs> My father and mother had gone to Argentina six months before that surgery to visit my father's family. It was the first time they had gone since they came to America. And my, my, mother, my mother was in Florida at the time, and my father came back to, for the surgery to be with me. Mm -hmm. We were at Brooklyn Jewish Hospital in Brooklyn. I think it's on Eastern Parkway. And right across the street, there's an old synagogue directly across the street. So we're waiting for the surgery to start with Debbie. And this old Jew comes in and speaks to me in Yiddish, just do a Yid, are you Jewish? Mm. And I, I spoke to him, but this conversation was all in Yiddish. Yes, I'm a Jew. He said, can you come across the street? Because we're short one man for a minion. Mm. A minion is when you have 10, 10 Jewish men. That it, It's more powerful. Mm -hmm. The prayer gets to heaven, gets to God quicker, mm -hmm. whatever. And I explained to him that I can't leave because my daughter is having surgery. So he goes to my father. I don't know what my father's answer is going to be. And he says to my father, how about you? Are you a Jew? My father says, yes. He said, can you come across the street and help us? My father looked at me and said, yes, of course. And I said to myself, then, mm -hmm. you? So he went. The up, the cert, oh, I got chills. The surgery started. It was a very, very long surgery. And my father came back in a couple of hours. And I said, Dad, what the hell is that? You're not a hypocrite. How could you do that? And he said, Davi, again, in Yiddish, for me, I don't believe. Mm -hmm. But I'm not taking any chances with my grandmother. <laughs> yes. Maybe they're yeah. right. Never Could forget be. that. He said, I'd listen, so for me, I'm not doing it. Yeah. But if they want to pray for my granddaughter, sure. remember him saying, I'm there. Hey, it's not my problem. Yeah. And of course, she, she was okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, it had a tremendous effect on Linda. I think much more on Linda than me because I had a lot of very close friends. To this day, some of them are still my friends. But Debbie's mother didn't have those kind of real powerful relationships. She was an only child, first of all. Her parents were much more, and this is not an insult, but her parents were much more Americanized. They were American. So a lot of the traditions that had to do with family or culture, or, I felt that she didn't have that, that support. Mm -hmm. She had friends, but also she was kind of closed she was not the kind of person who could talk about her feelings. Mm -hmm. And I obviously, you can tell, can. So she took it very hard. She began uh, just drinking a lot of coffee and smoking a lot of cigarettes and withdrawing. But, uh, and probably I did too. As a matter of fact, now we're jumping ahead into the next section of life. I began to drink a lot. Uh, my friends happened to be drinkers. One guy in particular, you should put his name down, Bob Stone. Uncle Bob, that we called him. His name, we called him Whitey. Whitey was 16 years old when he went to Michigan on a scholarship. One of the smartest kids you ever met. And he was in a fraternity where somebody knocked up the dean's daughter. Mm. And they blamed it on Whitey because he was the only one that was under 18. Oh, wow. So he got thrown out of school, unfortunately. Whitey became a uh, merchant marine telegraph operator, made a lot of money during Vietnam, working more shifts and double shifts. Mm -hmm. He died about 15 years ago of a brain tumor. He was really a drunk. He was really a falling down drunk. Mm. We drank together all the time. But that's a different phase. I want to go into that phase.